Okay, let me let a couple more people in. Oh, someone has nicely helped with that. Okay, let me welcome everyone. It's a, really a pleasure and a thrill to welcome you to our event today, 20 years since 9-11, what do we do now? I can't think of many events I've been more excited to help host. Uh, the people who you'll be hearing from today, whether live right now, or if you're listening and watching later, are a fantastic group that have been working on these issues for, in many years, in, in many cases, decades. Uh, uh, many I've known for a long time and some exciting people I have come to know recently who I'm particularly excited to get to know more. Um, I wanna thank the audience in particular for, for joining us. There are many things, many uh, events competing for your attention, for your time. And I wanna thank you for choosing to, to be with us. Uh, I do wanna begin by calling our attention to the colonized land occupied by our school, American University, in the Washington District of Columbia, uh, and the Piscataway, Pamunkey, and Nak Nakachenk, and Acostin, and other indigenous peoples and groups who currently occupy and formerly occupied this land. I think it's particularly important to rem remember and mark the indigenous occupants of this land as we talk about the last 20 years of war so that we recognize the much longer violent history of colonization and war uh, that uh, has enabled the colonization of the land beneath our feet. Now I wanna turn things over to someone who knows a lot about both history and the present. That is our Dean, Max Paul Friedman. Dean Friedman, Max, um, is the interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at American University. He's a professor of history and international relations, and just so happens to be an expert on topics at the heart of our conversation today, namely US intervention abroad across the 20th century. His books include Rethinking Anti-Americanism and Nazis and Good Neighbors. Max, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you, David, um, and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. The College of Arts and Sciences is uh, truly proud to co-sponsor this event and even prouder to provide the professional home for David Vine, whose dedicated work in his marvelous scholarship and in pursuit of peace and justice is legendary. David, I'm grateful to you for organizing this panel of extraordinary speakers today uh, at a moment when the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the collapse of the American war effort in Afghanistan have come together in instructive ways. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand the microphone back to David as MC, uh, also because I'm sorry that I can be with you today only for a short time. But I wanted to begin putting on my other hat as a historian of U.S. foreign relations and just briefly address what lies behind the easy parallel between desperate refugees clinging to U.S. airplanes as they take off from the airport in Kabul and desperate refugees clinging to US helicopters as they took off from the roof of a structure on the grounds of the US embassy in Saigon in 1975. It is not widely known that Ho Chi Minh offered constructive relations with the United States and was ready for a peaceful settlement in 1945, 1954, 1963, and 1968. And each time the US responded to his overtures and offers with military escalation until finally accepting a worse deal from a much more radicalized Vietnamese national movement in 1973 than the US could have gotten in each one of those previous years and only after the needless destruction of that country. I will be interested to see whether the experts on this panel think that there is a parallel in the Taliban's apparent willingness to negotiate in the framework of power sharing rather than seizing power outright as they have now done. Opportunities that arose in 2001, 2003, 2010, other key moments that could have avoided years of destruction and further radicalization. 
In Vietnam then, as in Afghanistan today, the fatal flaw was building a doomed counterinsurgency campaign around two glaring cases of perverse logic, that outsiders can construct popular support for unpopular corrupt regimes, and that the superior application of violence can build a new society in our image while winning hearts and minds. Then as now, insider experts like Bernard Fall in Vietnam or David Kilcullen in Afghanistan understood the fundamental limitations of the wars that they themselves supported, pointing out, as Kilkellen once put it, that local guerrillas don't fight because they hate our values. They fight because we are intruding into their physical and cultural space. Then, as now, those involved in the armed resistance were willing to undergo tremendous hardship and fight, mostly with small arms and improvised weapons, against the world's most advanced military. Because as North Vietnam's foreign minister, Nguyen Co Thach once put it, we knew that they could not stay in Vietnam forever, but Vietnam must stay in Vietnam forever. Then as now, enterprising journalists and officials with a conscience tried to bring the facts to light from Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers that showed how four American presidents had lied to the American public about every stage of the escalation of the Vietnam War, to Craig Whitlock and the Afghanistan papers, showing the endless sequence of official lies under four American presidents that painted such a rosy picture that this contributed directly to the catastrophic surprise effect of the final collapse in Kabul. Then as now, the US finally withdrew in part because an international grassroots movement of opposition had raised the political costs to the point that leaders decided it was no longer worth pursuing a goal that could not be accomplished in any case. Indeed, some of those on the panels today have played a part in leading enough Americans and people in other countries to understand the futility and harm caused by US intervention in Afghanistan that they ultimately demanded its end. So now that end has come, and rather than a celebration, we are seeing that the highest costs of such interventions are always paid by the populations who are their target. From the Vietnamese so-called re-education camps to the Taliban's night letters, revenge attacks, and expulsion of women from public life, we are witnessing what happens when decades of unnecessary war further radicalize the surviving members of the movement we have tried unsuccessfully to suppress. And we are now in a very weak position when we appeal to the Taliban to respect human rights and the rule of law. After 20 years of the war on terror with its black sites and torture and high-tech extrajudicial killings and Guantanamo's indefinite detentions, we simply have lost the moral ground on which to make the case if we had it. If there is a lesson of Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan that might be useful, It is that we know how to smash states, but we don't know how to build them. And more importantly, that casting aside the ideals we proclaim because we feel threatened or see an opportunity, that is a path to disaster. Whereas abiding by our best principles can be a good guide, not only to magnanimous behavior for the benefit of others, but to our own long-term self-interest. In an era when the most urgent problems in the world are not terrorism, but global scale calamities from pandemic through climate change and racist authoritarianism, we won't be able to look to military of force to address any of these and instead need concerted efforts at international cooperation where a United States rebalanced towards its best values could play a crucial role. At any rate, it is not true that the only thing we ever learn from history is that we never learn from history. Some of us do, And I'm grateful to all of you who continue to work so hard to bring what you know to a wider public so that one day we may no longer be condemned to repeat it. And with that, let me thank you again for coming and for your participation and turn it back over to David. Thank you so much, Max. I really appreciate your contributions and your kind words at the beginning. The truth is Max really deserves credit for getting this event started. And I I do wanna thank him and the entire College of Arts and Sciences Dean's office 
as well as Haley Jardis, Erica Fortwangler, Nikolai Roster, Thomas Neal, Jeannie Wogeman in the Department of Anthropology, uh, and all our fantastic captioners providing captions today. I also want to thank the panelists who I will introduce shortly, uh, who agreed to join us today in what are extremely busy schedules for all of them. I do want to make clear, and I'll, I'll share my screen now so you can get, get a sense of the, the panels that lie ahead for us. So we have two panels today, one between now and three o'clock Eastern time, and then another will begin immediately after, no break, um, that will take us to five o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I will introduce each speaker in turn. Akbar Ahmed uh, will be joining us in, in a little while. Um, he'll actually uh, be able to stay for part of the second panel as well. Um, and Inga Kia Kamara with AU Dissenters will also be joining us a little late, um, but our other fantastic speakers are here. And uh, I really look forward to the, the conversation uh, to come. Uh, we do wanna make this an interactive conversational event. So each of them, I've asked them to speak as briefly as possible. Uh, each of them could probably speak for four hours about the topics at hand. Uh, but I've, I've asked them to keep it, it brief so that we can have exchange among the panelists and then take questions and have a conversation with the audience. So let me just provide a little bit more uh, quick context, a lot of it coming from the fantastic work of the Costs of War Project, which I've been lucky enough to be uh, a part of. impossible, of course, uh, to adequately provide context to the conversation today, but uh, there, of course, was a fair amount of conversation about the roughly 3,000 people who died during the attacks of 9-11 and, and amid calls to never forget those deaths. And indeed, we shouldn't. No, no deaths should go uh, unremembered. No deaths should be forgotten. Uh, this little intervention in, in New York um, pointed out the scale of death in Afghanistan in comparison to that in New York, Pennsylvania, and Northern Virginia. In fact, the scale of death in Afghanistan is likely far higher. It may be around 750,000, including indirect deaths. The figure cited here uh, refers to people who died directly in combat with those who died uh, because of the destruction of food supplies, healthcare facilities, other infrastructure. Uh, the total could be around 750,000 or, or more. Here's one slide that attempts to portray the entire war on terror, the entirety of the post 9-11 wars, which of course have not ended. They are ongoing despite the withdrawal from US withdrawal from Afghanistan. 4.5 million dead, that builds off the cost of war projects estimate of more than 900,000 dead. Uh, the 4.5 million is my estimate that includes indirect deaths. Again, those who've died because of the destruction of food supplies, healthcare facilities, other infrastructure, disease. Clearly tens of millions injured in the war zones. 38 million displaced, and that again comes from the Cost of War Project and a report that one of our speakers, Jenny Walkup, uh, helped produce. $8 trillion has been either spent or obligated, that is the US taxpayers will eventually pay $8 trillion, and that's just on the war alone. Total Pentagon spending since 2001 is around $14 trillion. 14 trillion dollars. I think when we when we think about the costs, the human and financial costs of the war on terror, we have to think about where that money didn't go, how many lives we didn't save because that money wasn't invested in universal health care, for example, or pandemic preparedness, alleviating hunger, building a green energy infrastructure, among many other uses of the money. The money, of course, went somewhere. Uh, the last circle there tries to reflect the profits that have been made by some as a result of the 
trillions of dollars plowed into this war. Uh, Lockheed Martin was one of the biggest beneficiaries, the largest beneficiary, in fact, the largest arms manufacturer and recipient of Pentagon contracts. This is a sign of the benefit that Lockheed Martin stock received uh, between 2001 and the present. Uh, but they are just one of, of the top five contractors and recipients of Pentagon contracts in this period. I should, here are the other uh, in the top five, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman. I do have to make one disclosure, which is that uh, one of the newest members of the American University Board is the former CEO and chair of Northrop Grumman, Wes Bush hasn't influenced my work or the work of anyone here or the any aspect of this event, but it does deserve noting. With that, let me turn things over to the panelists, the people you came to hear today. We have a really exciting group of panelists. Um, I think I'm going to ask each to speak, I've asked each to speak for seven or eight minutes at most. And to, again, focus on some big picture ideas that they want to convey. I've asked them to respond to two questions, essentially. One is, what are the three most important things that people should learn and know about the attacks of 9-11 and the post 9-11 wars? And what are the three most important priorities for changing the United States and for change more broadly. I'm going to ask Claire Bayard to speak first. Just again, I'm going to introduce each very briefly to maximize our, our time for conversation. Claire Bayard is a, a dear friend who I met year, years ago. Um, she co founded the Catalyst Project more than 20 years ago and leads Catalyst anti-war and demilitarization work. She served on the National Committee, the board of the, she served on the National Committee of the War Resisters League since 2005, building connections between racial and economic justice struggles in the US and international anti-war work. Claire's a member of the War Resisters International Network and War Times, and works closely with About Face and Civilian Soldier Alliance. Claire's writing has been published widely, including in Left Turn, The Guardian, and the recent anthology, We Have Not Been Moved, Resisting Racism and Militarism in 20th century, 21st Century America. Claire, let me th turn things over to you. Um, okay. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Um, thank you. David and uh, everyone who helped organize this. I'm really honored to be in this conversation and to learn from the other panelists today as well. Uh, I'm calling in from occupied Ohlone land in Oakland, California. And there's been a lot of these conversations going on right now, which I'm really grateful for. Um, the opportunity to be drawing lessons from these last 20 years to make our work to undo US imperialism more effective. And I've been thinking a lot about lessons from this time in the US anti-war movement of what we did well and where we fell short and just keep coming up against this lesson that we can't build a durable, effective anti-war movement without looking at the entirety of what it means to undo US imperialism. And we can't do that without relationships with the people who are most targeted by this empire. So what I just wanna say a little bit about this morning is the importance of transnational solidarity. We, we really struggled around rooting anti-imperialist politics in the US anti-war movement. You, you may recall that the mainstream of the movement was really caught up in wanting to impeach Bush. The whiter, wealthier, liberal center of the movement had a very heavy pull away from looking at the whole structural picture of what the post 9-11 so-called global war on terror really consists of. Um, much more interested in focusing on shock and awe bombing campaigns and not much attention to Afghanistan, a real hard push to silence conversations about Palestine. And just talking about the Iraq war as being exceptionally illegal with no recognition that the US has never not been at war. 
since its foundation as a settler colonial nation. And as you said in the intro, David, just that the acceptance of a permanent state of war here really laid the ground for the Bush administration to push through the, the post 9-11 forever wars. So we learned that you just can't challenge one war as if it's anomalous. You can't take it out of the context of racism. And an anti-war movement has to be really grounded in home front struggles against empire and with the people who have been leading that resistance the whole time. So on this land, that is particularly black liberation movements and indigenous sovereignty and decolonization. But instead in the early 2000s, we really had this narrow focus on the excesses of the Bush administration as if, you know, if only this war was being conducted in a more respectable way. So then we were just unable to really pivot to Obama putting a different face on the war, shifting methods, same aims, and on the strategic side, you know, among other kinds of direct action and community organizing, we did build up a powerful counter recruitment and GI resistance movement to try to choke off the supply stream of labor into the war. But we weren't listening enough to the voices of people whose communities were being drone bombed in Somalia and Pakistan and elsewhere, who were alerting us that war making was shifting very rapidly towards this increased reliance on tech and remote killing and proxy forces. And that that shift was to be less reliant on the complicity of US soldiers and the consent of the public. So our leverage really eroded there. And what we need now is we need an anti-war movement that can take on current forms of hybrid war. So for example, we need a movement that understands sanctions as a tool of warfare, that broadly understands that. Of course, some people have been consistently resisting sanctions and that sees the resistance to US bases and installations around the world as some of the frontline leadership against US empire and that those are anti-war leaders who we need to be in closer relationship with. And we did build solidarity relationships over the last 20 years, um, despite the really intense challenges to building trust and working relationships during an ongoing war. Um, some of those initiatives have been led by anti-war veterans like About Face, formerly known as Iraq Veterans Against the War, who've been building relationships with Iraqi and Afghan grassroots progressive social movement groups for over 15 years with trade unionists, um, oil workers, women's organizations, like the Organization of Women for Freedom in Iraq. There is foundation to build from for the work ahead including reparations, which we need to be prioritizing. And just looking at the big picture of that, how social movements in the US are always weaker when we internalize American exceptionalism and nationalism and the same logics of these wars and isolate ourselves. We are always stronger when we're in connection with people's liberation movements around the world. You can look at the 60s versus the, the aughts. And just that transnational relationships are also their real sources of knowledge and inspiration and guidance in, in addition to our responsibility to be in relationship with the liberatory forces in these countries. But here, you know, I think right now we can also be looking to the resurgence of anti-militarist alliance building between black organizers, Palestinians in the diaspora and in Palestine, and indigenous leaders on this continent, that there are transnational relationships right here with indigenous nations who have never stopped their resistance to US colonization. And I'm very inspired by the coalition that's coming together to flank the leadership of Indian Collective's Land Back campaign, um, including leaders from Palestinian youth movement, just seeing ways that decolonization work is making these links across continents that that's on the rise again, at the same time as this rising tide of abolitionist organizing. And I think looking at how the abolition of militarism, including its domestic layers, is going to be a prerequisite to abolishing the US as an empire to reconstitute it as an actual democracy. We are not and have not been a functional democracy, but we could be, and the visions are out there of what it could look like to 
end the global war on terror, the military industrial carceral complex, which is a lot of big words to say that we design our society around repression. We put our resources into violence and death instead of into life-giving structures and services. But there are examples of those visions because people are doing that work. Um, I hope on the next panel that you'll get to hear more about the new policy agenda, uh, abolishing the war on terror, building communities of care, grassroots policy agenda that was just released by the Muslim Justice Collective and their partners. Um, we also are looking to the feminist foreign policy initiative that grassroots global justice and a number of their partners put out and also the movement for black lives vision for black lives and the policy platform there around what does it look to divest from repression and violence and invest in life and real safety and i think to close just it's much bigger than what happens within the US and on this land, right? Our survival as a species is pretty dependent on whether we can build transnational solidarity. That is, that is the antidote to the global war on terror, but it's also our future. We're not gonna survive climate chaos without that. We're not gonna survive more generations of increasing violence to defend growing disparities. And I'm really excited to hear from the other panelists, including from dissenters, who I think are doing some of the most hopeful youth-led anti-militarist organizing in this country. And I kept it to eight minutes, David. That was a challenge. Thank you for that challenge. <laughs> Claire, thank you so, so much for keeping it to eight minutes. It's an impossible task that I've given each of you. Um, so I really appreciate your brevity because we'll be able to get into more detail shortly. Um, I'm gonna ask Jenny Walkup, our fantastic um, representative of both the American University Department of Anthropology and uh, uh, who's worked in, in great depth with uh, the Cost of War Project. Um, Jenny Walkup is a public anthropologist, facilitator, and community builder. Uh, the Cost of War Project at Brown University will soon publish her report about alternatives to using war as a response to acts of terrorism. Jenny's the co-author of the studies cost of war project report creating refugees displacement caused by the united states's post 9 11 wars she works in u.s social movements including jewish movements to end the israeli occupation of palestinian land and bodies thank you jenny hi thank you for having me um dr friedman mentioned the sort of two logical fallacies and i want to dig into one of them in a little bit more detail, or maybe it's the third, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I wanna start with this question. The big thing that we you know, have been talking about for a long time and what is ostensibly the reason that we, the United States entered into the wars on terrorism is terrorism, right? And what is it? One of the absolutely most shocking realizations to me in conducting this research is that there is not an agreed upon definition of terrorism. Um, US government departments use different definitions, like up to 20, and some of them conflict. Um, there are at least 250 separate definitions of terrorism floating around in academia. The UN doesn't have a definition of terrorism. It uh, has tried to ratify uh, a couple times a uh, definition, but has been unsuccessful. So most people in the UN are using a working definition from the League of Nations. There's a lot of conversation right now, in particular, about terrorism and terrorists and what we should be doing about domestic extremists or domestic terrorists. And I think it's really important that we understand that when people use that word, they don't, they frequently don't mean the same thing. Uh, colloquially, I understand terrorism as something that targets civilians. So not military, not government, but civilians. But not all definitions require this, including the new and quite, uh, quite circular, I would say, uh, definition put forth by the Department of Defense earlier this summer. I think the most useful way to understand terrorism is as a tactic. It's a tactic of political violence where a symbolic target is used to inspire a psychological response among an audience. It's inherently communicative. 
right? It aims to send a message, but understanding that terrorism is a tactic requires us to recognize that there's a difference between the terrorist act and the terrorist group or the person who commits that act. Groups and people that use terrorism can and do switch to nonviolence or to other tactics and other organizations can begin using it. Because terrorism is so poorly defined, the label of terrorist is frequently used to discredit political enemies and to basically authorize the use of state violence against them. I am extremely wary, for instance, of attempts to label the Capitol rioters as terrorists because doing so, frankly, justifies turning the entire apparatus of the war on terror, which has been violent and unsuccessful, inward toward US citizens further. Um, something that Bush sort of pointed at in his speech last week on the anniversary of 9-11. Following, you know, the September 11th attacks, his administration had adopted the war paradigm as their primary framework for their response. And it was quickly absorbed by news and other media, even though it was actually quite a departure from international and domestic political norms. In the past, terrorism had been treated mostly as a political problem and prosecuted through the, or the criminal justice system. Also, legally, the attacks of 9-11 did not constitute warfare. War metaphor really doesn't fit um, with the problem of terrorism. You can't go to war on a tactic, doesn't make any sense. Um, wars are theoretically zero sum. There is a winner and a loser. There's us, there's an enemy, right? Um, there's not room for negotiation and there's not room for providing aid to uh, quote unquote, enemy communities, right? You also have the problem of blowback. When people's homes are invaded, when people witness occupation, when people witness violence, uh, when people are repressed, they tend to want to fight back. And so when we do sort of military action against people, it actually sort of bolsters the, the support of terrorist groups. The so question is, what are our alternatives, right? Before 9-11, as I mentioned, a criminal justice or a policing approach to terrorism was dominant, both in the United States and internationally. After all, most acts of terrorism, bombing, kidnapping, hijacking, those are already crimes. Uh, and they can be prosecuted through the criminal courts, so long as the people writ large believe the courts to be more or less just. This approach, a policing approach, has been responsible for the demise of an estimated 40% of terrorist groups historically. A great example of this is the elimination of the Aung Shinrikyo, the doomsday cult in Japan. In 1995, uh, members of the cult released sarin gas in the Tokyo subway, and 12 people were killed, 5,000 people were injured, and there was great concern that terrorist groups had access to chemical warfare. We'll see this uh, concern repeated later. Uh, yeah. Um, following the attacks, Japanese police and intelligence officials began aggressively pursuing and arresting those involved. And by two years later, in 97, uh, they'd pretty much been eradicated. Leadership was arrested, finances were in shambles. The remaining members of the cult changed its name to Aleph and ceased terrorist activity. Most frequently, when terrorist groups end, they do so through entry into the political sphere. This feels really counterintuitive for those of us who are raised on the we don't negotiate with terrorists uh, kind of vibe. Actually, about 43% of terrorist groups that end do so when they become a political party, right? This is because groups can abandon the practice of terrorism if they believe that their goals can be met uh, in a different way, in a more peaceful way, potentially. Um, it's a lot more feasible to do this, by the way, when a group has relatively moderate or narrow goals. So a group like, for instance, uh, the Islamic State that wants to dismantle a number of different countries and build a caliphate, probably not going to be able to achieve those goals through the political sphere. It's unlikely that they would make that decision because it doesn't make any sense for their goals, right? But famously, this was the path that the IRA took, right? It was subsumed under Sinn Féin, its political wing, became a political party. 
In such cases, conflict resolution and negotiation can be really powerful tools for ending terrorism or for ending terrorist violence, at least. But to me, the most promising remedy to violent extremism is building a world in which people are able to address their concerns and meet their needs without resorting to violent tactics. So-called long-term counterterrorism models focus on eliminating terrorism at its root causes by providing people with access to needed resources and equitable social distribution. Uh, unequal, uh, sorry, equitable social conditions. Unequal land distribution, poor environmental management, extraction of local resources are all strong motivators for the development of movements globally, and that includes extremist movements. In summary, David asked what the three most important things to know um, about the 9-11 terrorist attacks are and the three most important things going forward, and I think for me they're the flip of each other. One, I think it's important to be really wary when someone uses the word terrorist or terrorism, because the definition is so vague, but the implications are so strong, right? The implications are this person or this group should have violence done to them by the state. They are not deserving of the same protocols of justice that other people might be. Um, basically it's saying, I think it's okay for the government to kill these people. That's really dangerous. Secondly, warfare and militarism have proven to be largely ineffective against terrorism and have shown enormous violence, instability, and tragedy. It doesn't work. And third, I think we can head terrorism off at the pass um, if we create a world that is more just and more equal. Jenny, thank you so, so much. Um, covering a lot of ground very quickly. Let me quickly now segue to our next speaker, Kyle Bibby. Well, we'll spotlight for everyone. <clears throat> Kyle Bibby is National Campaigns Manager for Common Defense. Kyle's a US Naval Academy graduate, a former Marine Corps infantry officer, and a former presidential management fellow in the Obama administration. Following his fellowship, he worked for a year as director of the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, helping the formerly incarcerated transition back to society. Kyle is one of the co-founders of the Black Veterans Project. Kyle, thank you for joining us. Take it away. Okay, thank you for having me, David. Um, yeah, um, what, what a, <laughs> you know, this is, it's obviously a really big topic to talk about 9-11 uh, and 20 years of war. Um, and I, I felt like I had struggled a bit even to uh, find how I wanted to narrow things down. Um, and, and when I started thinking, you know, I looked at the panel and I figured one thing that I feel like I'd probably offer um, that might not be as common uh, in some of these discussions is that I was not only young when 9-11 happened, I was young enough where I was prior to my military service. It greatly impacted my personal experiences and my decision to join um, for a number of complicated reasons. <laughs> I mean, I'll put it up front, a lot of it was fear. Um, and I think that that was um, certainly the, the forward facing emotion that most people had after 9-11. But, you know, I, I'm one of the, you know, um, well, I'm a dime a dozen at common defense for people who served and are very critical of these wars. But, you know, um, I think for this panel, I, I, I thought it would be best if I shared what it was like as a young person who was understandably afraid after 9-11, then walked into you know, what had been sold to me really throughout my entire life through our over-militarized culture as the right choice and the real decision uh, to come forward and serve your country. And then to find out years and years later, you know, through really experiences in Afghanistan, but really just kind of, you know, also the, the experiences as a, as a military officer that so much of what we were presented, uh, the young people in this country who did decide to step forward and, and serve was a lie. Nation building was a lie. Uh, this ultimately served an imperialist, you know, project here in the United States that, you know, the, the inherent arrogance of us to, you know, go overseas and think that we can now, you know, put on to other communities uh, the way that they should be living and, and such, you know, um, and really just a, a ton of squandered potential goodwill um, after 9-11 for us to do good things around the world that instead we, we put towards two, um, you know, 
long failed illegal wars. Um, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Common Defense where I work. Uh, we're a group of progressive veterans. Um, our, our main campaign has been, uh, and, and you know, arguably now one of our most successful campaigns was our End the Forever War campaign, which was built around uh, taking veterans to Congress, getting them to pledge to us that they would end these wars in a responsible but expedient way. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially changing the dialogue around the war. And, uh, you know, we have been largely successful in that fortunately. Um, but, um, you know, there, it, it, was, it was certainly not without a, a lot of learning on our, our side about, um, you know, I feel like now all of the people, you see it a lot in the press, people talking about the blob, the national security blob, and, you know, us having to actually go kind of to, <laughs> for, you know, excuse the analogy, but go to war with the blob rather than, you know, um, going to war overseas. Um, and even now, I think there was like a, you know, New York Times article or something today where, you know, they're talking to some folks who are saying, please don't call us the blob, don't call us this and that. Um, but, you know, we're going to keep doing it because, you know, that I, I, I do think that it was ultimately um, the best way to describe, unfortunately, what started happening in the United States um, after 9-11. It, it, it was just this force, this momentum that, that was really initially driven by fear um, and, and guided by arrogance. Um, and, and again, it swallowed up thousands of lives. Um, across um, you know, um, the military and, and so, so many more um, overseas. And, and that was the real tragedy. So at Common Defense, we wanted to elevate that among other sort of electoral work that we do, but that is, that is easily our largest issue-based campaign. Um, I will say, you know, that, uh, you know, I was asked to talk about the three things I learned from 9-11. Again, uh, you know, I wanna share what it was like, you know, being 15 from central New Jersey where I'm from in a hub town where multiple people in my city worked uh, in New York City, you know, that day was very terrifying. Um, and, you know, I mentioned before that, that the reason I actually joined the military was based out of fear. Um, you know, I didn't recognize that as a young man, but, um, you know, that was certainly it. Um, and, you know, looking back, it, it was not just a terrifying time, but it was really just also so weird. It was just such a weird time, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, because, Things were just, ha you know, I, I saw a few days ago, Vanity Fair had the national security cabinet on the front page. Like, you know, it's just these really, un, un, you know, really unusual things that all really, it was like the culminating moment really of, of the over-militarization of our culture, you know, um, after 9-11, you know, where um, we were ready to go essentially invade anyone and, and, and you know, attack anywhere just to, to try and get some sense of vengeance or, or whatever would have taken place. Um, and, and one of the big lies, though, I think about 9-11, again, or after 9-11, and this is the, one of the things I learned, was that you know, people said that it was a moment of unity afterwards. And I really want to be clear, it was not a moment of unity. <laughs> this was a realignment. This was a realignment from, you know, how the United States views itself and its adversaries and its enemies to changing that and really kind of aligning, you know, what had been prior to you know, pro probably like a national security picture that was post Cold War, pre 9 11, um, and and certainly did talk about you know terrorism around the world, but taking that and then aligning it into a domestic sense, and in some ways tying into the mass incarceration state of the 90s and all these other things. So um, you know that's one thing that that I learned. You know that that um, you know this, or really that I want to emphasize that it was not a, a moment of unity; it was a realignment. Um, I learned what war was like. You know um, which. You know, uh, you know, again, we come up in this over-militarized culture where young people, your kids are playing with toys that are, you know, G.I. Joes and Transformers and all of this. And our TV, um, our TV shows, movies, all of it is so saturated with glorification of war and glorification of combat, death and firearms. And that makes it so easy then for young people like me when I was 15 to view that rather than, you know, like, let's, let's drill down to what actually causes some of these real issues. Let's view this violence, you know, the, the act of violence, you know, these wars as, as the real, of course, inherent solution to these problems that have been taking place. And we never questioned that for 20 years. You know, even now, I feel like we've not had that reckoning. We've not really had the reckoning. It's more so, oh, well, sometimes you lose wars rather than why were we at war for 20 years, right? So, um, you know, um, and then lastly, of course, and, and this has been said before by some of the folks already on the call, a real... Um, it, it, this, these 20 years have really taught me, you know, how imperialism works and how it is tied into, how it's tied into racism, how, you know, how constantly, and this was also tied into my time 
as a presidential management fellow in the Obama administration, I was a budget analyst in the Office of Management and Budget. And, you know, I remember I, I almost flipped when I learned that, you know, one of the ways that they categorize the budget, the discretionary budget, is defense discretionary and non-defense discretionary, which is a perfect encapsulation of how we view our priorities here in the United States, which is defense and war and everything else. And everything else is constantly pit against that. Um, so, you know, for me, th those are some of the things that I really learned. Um, you know, what do we need to change? Uh, you know, we, we need to learn how to demilitarize our culture. Because again, you know, I, I always say our culture holistically because these wars, you know, we, we saw the buildup after 9-11 and, you know, and, and again, you know, I'm, I'm a former Marine infantry officer. I'm certainly not, you know, I'm not, I'm not Mr. Abolish the military, but I'm certainly, you know, let's abolish the imperialist state. Um, and I think, um, you know, what we've seen from this growth after 9-11 has now trickled into our communities. The same armored vehicles that I used over in Afghanistan in communities that I had no business really trying to do development work. And again, also, you know, the absurdity of doing development work in camouflage utilities with rifles and sitting across from people and expecting to have a real dialogue with, with the implicit, you know, threat of an American airstrike or a drone strike should they not comply with what I'm, you know, softly asking them. You know, um, but all of that equipment now trickles back here to the United States. It ends up in our police departments. It ends up, you know, being something that we kind of just, you know, and, and now we, in some places, you know, some parts of the country and for some people, they, they glorify that. This is great. We have this stuff here now so we can, we can fight them here. You know, we, we, we are bringing the war back to the United States, the one that we were finally able to end uh, overseas. And that to me, again, is, is the real tell of the, the over militarization of our culture that is not challenged. Um, and, you know, so um, I, I guess I'll end with that. Um, I will say we get to the Q&A portion. Um, I know some folks, um, you, can, you can feel maybe a bit uncomfortable asking me about my time in Afghanistan. I, I don't mind um, talking about that. So feel free to ask any other question, any questions you have. Um, I wouldn't be on this panel if I wasn't willing to ask questions. So I did just want to preface that to folks, if, if you feel that you know, it might not be a comfortable question to ask. If it's not comfortable, I won't answer it, but feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, that's it though. Thank you, David. Kyle, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, you sound some, like something of an anthropologist, uh, focus on, on culture, which I, I, I'm one of the many reasons I'm so excited about this event is the way that all the folks who are on our panels are complementing each other. And I also have to point out that some of the folks on our second panel have been nice enough to share some of their time and join us already, uh, including Phyllis Bennis and Maha Hilal. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Lawrence Wilkerson, um, another veteran, uh, Vietnam War veteran. Uh, we've more or less been going in alphabetical order, although Kyle had to step away for a moment. Um, uh, so Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson I served 31 years in the US Army, including in Vietnam, retiring as a colonel. He's the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Government and Public Policy at the College of William and Mary. Wilkerson served as Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell during the George W. Bush administration. He's a senior fellow at the Eisenhower Media Network, among other positions, and he speaks regularly in national and international media outlets. Colonel Wilkerson, please take us away. David, I'm looking at my stopwatch and starting it right now. Start, there it goes. I'm most interested in the remarks I've heard to this point and probably the same for the remarks I will hear throughout the rest of this event. Um, I was taken with Dr. Friedman's quotation from David Kilcullen. I did a book review with David Kilcullen for C-SPAN's Book World. And we had an opportunity to talk off camera as it were. And we talked about his experience in East Timor um, with a very uh, frightening prospect of major combat with an Indonesian unit that moved into his more or less peacekeeping mission without anyone's permission. Um, and my experience in Vietnam. And I, I liked what Dr. Friedman picked to cite from David, essentially that when you go into a country where the country's natives are willing to fight you forever, and you are on a distinct timeline, you must be, there's no other way you could not stay in the country forever, you're gonna lose. And David, of course, made a study of such occasions 
over a sweep of history and found that better than, as I recall, 80% of the time, the intervening outside power always lost. So the question that arises in my mind, both as an academic and a soldier, immediately is why the hell do we do it? And so you have to look for other reasons than rational ones, unless you consider making money and the things that really motivate us to do it as rational. And of course, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and a host of others who participate in this, Halliburton made $40 billion off Afghanistan and Iraq combined, uh, then you understand they're very rational decisions. But I wanted to move up into the ether a bit, if I could, and say, because my area of study and teaching is post-World War II. And though I agree with one of the speakers that we have a history of war, that we are a warlike nation, we also had some founders like James Madison who said things like, give the war power to the executive and you invite tyranny through its most surest route. You invite the destruction of anything that might even resemble a democracy. Well, I saw that happen personally up close in 2001. Um, we argued, as a matter of fact, that law enforcement had always been the approach we'd taken to terrorism, um, that the only deviation from that was Ronald Reagan and his raid on Libya in April of 1986, and that that was a pretty good pattern to follow, that unleashing the war instrument not only gave the executive, as we would see proved again and again with the Patriot Act and other things, unlimited power domestically, but also internationally to be a, a uh, war criminal, and that's exactly what we got. So I wanna dive into that for a second, and that's about all I have, and say that, why do we do this? Why do I see this huge change after World War II in what was, yes, a, a warlike, a violent temperament, but now has become almost a preoccupation? Why are we a state whose raison d'etre is making war? <laughs> Well, we've outlined some of the reasons, but I want to go even higher than that because we're 340 million some odd people. One of the reasons I've come to that dwells in this Easter is because we think we're God. That's not an easy statement to make. It doesn't come cavalierly off my tongue. As a nation, we think we're God. And we think we can make things in the world. And this has evangelical uh, repercussions, of course and implications. After all, we sent missionaries abroad to Iran, to all, all over the world for most of our history. Um, and it has some uh, realpolitik implications. We think we're God. Henry Kissinger thought he was God. Zig Brzezinski thought he was God. I have a sneaking suspicion that Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken think they're at least God's disciples. And Joe Biden might be in there with them too. Well, Counter this with the other sensation that I get from the world, and I've been in most of it for the last 20 years, from the Southeast Asia to uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, Brunei, Indonesia, all the way over to the Russian landmass that stretches for 11 time zones to the subcontinent. That is the other aspect of this world condition right now that we've created. And that is that 3.5 billion plus people don't think we're God, they think we're the freaking devil. In fact, in poll after poll, as we were really at the height of the war on terror, so-called, you could see that in Korea, an ally, in Pakistan, a supposed ally, better than 80% of the people under 40 years old thought the greatest threat to their future and their children's future was the United States of America. Not North Korea for the South Koreans, not India for the Pakistanis, us. It was the same for the Egyptians, the same for most of the Arab countries, 22 strong. Um, so that's the second thing. We think we're God and the rest of the world knows we aren't and thinks we're the opposite, or at least a goodly portion of it does. That's a sad state of affairs for an empire an empire of liberty and justice and freedom and democracy, as Washington and Jefferson conjured, an empire of war, as we have conjured since World War II. How did we get this way? We're a democracy, or at least a pretend democracy. 
we got this, babe, by lack of attention, by lack of caring, and by a cultivated ignorance that is so deep now that I'm not sure we can break out of it. Okay, how do we get out of this? How do we find an off-ramp confronting two of the most existential threats we have ever confronted, the human race indeed has ever confronted, nuclear weapons, back again with a vengeance. We have lost almost all the arms control we carefully crafted since the invention of those weapons. The arms control is lying in tatters. The only thing left is new start. And I'm not even sure that that's gonna be anywhere near significant to restrain the two major powers, us and the Soviet Union, and China is breaking out too. We're making missiles now with warheads that are tactical. Let me tell you, there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. And yet the Russians are treating it as such and we're treating it as such. We're back to where we were in the early 50s when military officers thought nuclear weapons had utility on the battlefield. That's a recipe for global destruction. And then the second one, the climate crisis. So we've arrived at this point in our history this incredible low point in our imperial reign, if you will. And we're facing these two crises which require maximum global cooperation, maximum global work, and maximum global effort. Otherwise, we're toast, the empire and most of humanity probably. So how did we do this? How did we let this happen again? We have not been paying any attention to what's happening in our democracy. We've been making money. We've been trying to you know, do what's necessary to survive. And I understand that. And this pandemic has made it even worse in that regard. But we better start paying attention. Every single American better start paying attention. And the majority of the elite who really are the people who run this country, whether you call them a deep state or whatever, better start paying attention. And they better start paying better attention because they are, as one of my friends said to me recently, they're eating the goose or killing the goose that's laying the golden eggs. And it's not gonna last much longer. This empire is headed down. It's headed down abruptly or slowly, take your pick, but it's headed down. And the rest of the world is moving, moving concertedly now to balance us. Our enemies and even some of our friends and allies are moving to balance us. So we've got to do something about that. Now I'll end there. Well, Kristen, <clears throat> thank you so much. And thank you especially for calling our attention to the question of how do we get off this path, which I, I really want us to take up in the, the conversation that follows. And I appreciate all the folks who've uh, pointed in that direction, because our, our, our point of being here today is not just learning or understanding for the sake of understanding, but understanding for the sake of action. Let me turn things over to Dr. Maha Hilal who will uh, speak next. Uh, let me quickly introduce Dr. Halal. Uh, Dr. Maha Halal is a researcher and writer on institutionalized Islamophobia and the author of the forthcoming book due out on October 26, very soon, Innocent Until Proven Muslim, Islamophobia, the War on Terror, and the Muslim Experience Since 9-11. She's also co-director of Justice for Muslims Collective, where she focuses on political consciousness and narrative shifting. Her writings have appeared in Vox, Al Jazeera, Middle East Eye, Newsweek, Business Insider, Truth Out, among many others. Dr. Halal, please take, it, take us over. Well, thank you so much, um, David, for organizing this panel and, and thank you all for being here today. I wanted to just start with a quick anecdote. So I have a colleague who works at a small liberal arts college and the college was having a vigil for the 9-11 victims, of course, who were killed 20 years ago. My colleague is Arab and Muslim and her husband is also Arab and Muslim. What was interesting about what my colleague told me is that they didn't feel comfortable going to the 9-11 vigil. They didn't know how their presence would be received. They didn't know what message it would be sending. They didn't know if people would think, oh, those are the people we should blame, or these are people that are here with us in solidarity. Would they get uncomfortable stares? Would they be made to feel like they're otherized and don't belong? So this simple act of going to a 9-11 vigil to think about 
and reflect on the deaths of innocent people was not something that could be shared by two people who identified as Muslim and Arab. And I think that that is at the, this, this question and this issue of identity is one of the things I think has been neglected the most in the course of the conversation and discourse on the war on terror. Namely that the war on terror has primarily and disproportionately targeted Muslims. Yet it's Muslims that are continuously invisibilized when we talk about the war on terror. I have been in numerous panels and have conducted numerous speeches where the context is not framed as one impacting Muslims, whether domestically or abroad. This is the case in liberal and progressive circles. It's also the case in other circles, right? So there's an intentional or unintentional um, sort of mis or denial of the fact of who is this actually targeting? And when we think about how to dismantle the war on terror, we can't do that if we don't know in part what is at the root of the war on terror. There have been many times where President Bush or President Obama, for example, would say, this is not a war on Islam. That's true because you can't wage a war on a religion, but what you can do is wage war on the adherents of that religion. And that has been the case again for the last 20 years. So I wanna reflect a little bit on two speeches that were given on 9-11. One was in the form of a video speech that Biden delivered. And I wanna just highlight a couple of things that he said. One, the world was changed forever. That's nothing new, right? President Trump said that, President Obama said that, President Bush said that. But why was it that the world was changed forever because of an atrocity that the United States experienced? There have been obviously numerous atrocities across the world, but those atrocities did not change fundamentally the global world order. Two, he said that we should not discriminate or that there shouldn't be mistreatment of Muslims, right? Well, he didn't connect or say anything about why Muslims were mistreated in the first place namely state violence. We can talk about hate crimes, but hate crimes are a symptom of state violence. When society learns and sees how the state is targeting Muslims with impunity, society responds accordingly. And that's exactly what has happened in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. He also said that there's, um, he, sorry, he mentioned that we should never forget, of course. He talked about unity, which I know um, Kyle addressed in part. And of course, there was no unity. A sick man, as most of you probably know, was murdered four days after the 9-11 attacks. And if that's what counts as unity, then I'm not sure what unity actually is. He also addressed Biden in his previous speech on Afghanistan, the cost of war from Brown University, which was great, right? It puts things in perspective. However, what is never publicly stated as the cost of war by the government is how many Muslim civilians and other civilians have been killed in the war on terror. You can't reduce the war on terror, obviously, to how much it's costed numerically. There are lives that have been lost. Of course, we know that when it comes to people in the military, that number is always made very clear. When it comes to others, Afghans, Iraqis, Somalis, Pakistanis, and the list goes on, there's ambiguity. Well, either they're collateral damage or 
In the case of the four, the 13 servicemen that were previously killed in Afghanistan recently, people would say things like the 13 service members and the others. Who are these others? They're people, right? And in Bush's speech on 9-11, he talked about this idea that the enemy hates us. Now, this has been a perpetual narrative, obviously, for the last 20 years, because that's the narrative that helps to sustain and support militarism. And we have to recognize, of course, what Bush's speech actually was. His speech was about whitewashing the damage he has caused. The fact that he was the architect, his administration was the architect of the war on terror. And any admission of that would bring him strong critique in addition to the critique he's already receiving. He also said in his speech on 9-11 that there's little cultural overlap between violent extremism abroad and violent extreme, extremism at home. So essentially, he's just trying to perpetuate this problem. And I, I don't actually know what it means to have cultural overlap or not overlap. I actually do not understand what the cultural overlap in violent extremists would mean, except for if you're talking about there's Muslims and there are people that are not Muslim. So when I think about the war on terror, I think these narratives are so crucial to how we understand the way that this country has violently engaged in the targeting of other countries. My um, thought about how to conceptualize the war on terror in my forthcoming book, I wanted to understand it in broader terms. So to me, the war on terror has never been just about militarism and warfare. The war on terror is about draconian immigration policies. The war on terror is about surveillance. The war on terror is about detention and torture. And the war on terror is about federal terrorism prosecutions. This is not to say that the problematic ways that policies and laws have been implemented post 9-11 are completely new. But it is to say that many of these policies and laws have been shaped significantly by the national security architecture and context post 9-11. So what I've just laid out is what I refer to as the five dimensions of the war on terror. And if we think about those five dimensions, then when we talk about ending the war on terror, it doesn't just mean ending militarism and warfare abroad. It's much larger than that. And unfortunately, we focus so much on militarism and warfare, which is obviously very important, but other structures and dimensions of the war on terror have become so invisibilized that it is very difficult to understand what it would take to change the course of the war on terror. One of the fundamental issues is the question of terrorism, right? So obviously, as Jenny talked about, the concept of terrorism is very flawed. Along with that is the concept of counterterrorism, right? Because counterterrorism basically is a term to suggest, right? that whatever measures are done in response to terrorism are legitimate and justified because you're not doing anything outside of what has already been done vis-a-vis -vis terrorism. Now there's another question. Terrorism is not just about, the construction of terrorism is not just about who's targeted. Terrorism is about who inflicts the violence. So when Ilhan Omar was targeted a couple months ago because of her statements on the ICC and uh, the US, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban, she had a lot of, she received a lot of backlash 
because of this idea of moral equivalent, how could you possibly equate the US and Israel to the violence of the Taliban? Well, it's simple. Not that she was doing this, but in my analysis, the reason there you can equate them or measure them at least is because there's nothing about state violence that is inherently more moral than non-state actor violence. There's nothing. And the reason why you have to keep it and sustain it as more moral is so that anything you do in response is automatically deemed moral. There was a speech that Bush gave in 2006 where he was saying something in the lines of, I can't believe people are comparing us to the terrorists. They kill women and children. This country has killed millions of women and children. Is that really something that separates the violence of the United States from the violence of non-state actors? Absolutely not. Then perhaps the, the last thing I'll address is the idea of the war ending and the idea of success and failure. So when the US troops withdrew from Afghanistan, Biden, right, of course, among many others said that the war was ending. What does it actually mean for a war to end? Maybe for Americans who don't have to experience necessarily the visible and physical impacts and costs of war, the war ended. How did the war end for people in Afghanistan? Number one, the United States is still going to be a presence there. Number two, now they've been left with a country in chaos. And to be clear, even if the Afghans wanted the United States to leave, it didn't mean that they wanted them to leave on those terms and with such negligence. So we also have to, again, push back against these problematic narratives. And I think, yes, I'm gonna wrap up. So I think when we talk about <laughs> problematic narratives, if you ever wanna probe deeper into that, Afghanistan is a very perfect and acute example of the ways war has been legitimized by this country. And so the last thing I'll say is in terms of success and failure, I don't actually know what the metrics are for success and failure. Apparently failure is not about how many millions of people had to die and get killed. It's not about the fact that a young Pakistani boy can no longer look at a blue sky and not be in fear that there's going to be a drone. It's not that a CIA prisoner who was killed in CIA custody died of hypothermia. His family was never informed and still to this day, even though he was murdered in 2002, does not know where his family is. So is that a failure or is it a success? And there are many different metrics. Perhaps we can talk about them, the Q and A. And so I will just stop there and, and just reiterate the importance, especially of narratives and really pushing back on and critiquing the ways that they sustain war and empire. Thank you, Dr. Halal. Uh, really appreciate, again, the wonderfully complimentary words. Let me turn quickly now to Ambassador Akbar Ahmed, who I'm very pleased uh, to see. He has a very busy schedule and uh, really glad you're able to join us a little earlier than expected. Ambassador Ahmed is an anthropologist, Islamic scholar, poet, playwright, and filmmaker, described as the world's leading authority on contemporary Islam by the BBC. For the past 20 years, Ambassador Ahmed has held the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University's School of International Service and previously served as the Pakistani High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. Ambassador Ahmed, please take us away. Thank you, Professor David Vine. Thank you for organizing this incredibly important event. Uh, you're a great scholar, but also a great administrator. I'm proud that I'm on a panel with some very, very distinguished people. I see one of my heroes, uh, Colonel Wilkerson, uh, uh, is with you for this panel. And I'm delighted that you have so many students joining us. So very briefly, and I'll keep to the time limit. Uh, I was in class on 9-11. I had just joined the university and my class began to disintegrate because one of the planes slammed into the Pentagon. 
And I realized two things that day. Number one, that there was going to be a huge gap between Muslims and non-Muslims, and that gap will grow. And number two, that I had to make a personal choice. Do I jump in and do everything in my power to help create bridges or opt out? Many people, in fact, said, just keep your head under the parapet. So I threw myself in and uh, I went through a cycle of speeches, lectures, conferences, White House, Pentagon, think tanks, TV, BBC, books, and so on. And that hasn't really ended. Uh, here we are again uh, on your panel. Now, in October, just a few weeks after 9-11, I spoke at the National Press Club. And that was a scene worth recording. There was a great deal of anger. The, the, it was packed. There were very distinguished people there. There were two or three very distinguished uh, panelists. I was uh, very new, but I was invited to be on the panel. And observing the anger in almost irrational levels, I said three things. I said, look, I have some experience of that world. You're going into a part of the world you don't know very much about. So here are my three tips. Number one, do not go in without a clear objective. What do you want to do when you go in? Are you going to create a new nation? Are you going to remove the government? Are you going to form a modern state? What are you going to do? Number two, do not go in without an exit strategy. What is your strategy to come out? And number three, I said you must have some understanding of the society you're going into. That area is called the graveyard of empires for a reason. It's a highly tribal society. And later on, I did a study of uh, tribal societies in the thistle and the drone. And I studied 40 four zero case studies from Morocco across North Africa into the Middle East and into the uh, Caucasus mountains. And there were patterns, the code of honor, the hospitality, the courage, but also a very defined sense of revenge which often trumped Islam's very clear, very clear exhortation towards forgiveness and compassion. This is a very important point I'm making. So compassion, forgiveness was set aside for tribal revenge. And I was reminded of Benjamin Franklin, these great, wonderful founding fathers of America. And Franklin had said, what begins in anger ends in shame. And I did share this with the audience. I can tell you, I had absolutely no response. People looked at me with glazed eyes and went on to vent their anger. And I knew that this anger is going to land everyone in trouble. And here we are two decades later uh, with the scale, a military defeat, which I think Colonel Wilkerson will understand the reference and the enormity of the reference. The only thing you can compare this to is 1842 after the first Anglo-Afghan war when the only soldier that survived that uh, expedition was Major Bryden outside the fort of Jalalabad, and that was the last remnant of the army of the Indus. So in scale, this is a, a really a, a, a seminal event that's happened. I don't think it's sunk in here in the United States. We don't seem to very, care very much about outside events and forces, even though they relate to us. And what did we see? What did we see over the last two decades? We saw anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head. We saw Islamophobia, Sikhophobia, Hindu-phobia, Xenophobia, all these terrible phobias emerging, uh, sometimes being directed, unfortunately, by politicians. In the meantime, we saw some of the poorest people on earth, Yemen, Iraq, Somalia, Afghanistan, the northern areas of Pakistan. These are really societies living on subsistence levels. And they were subject to drone attacks, missile attacks, and in turn, and in turn, the impression that they had was of an America on the rampage. So you had stories, terrible stories of torture, waterboarding, uh, urinating on Afghan on bodies, on Afghan bodies, flushing the Quran down the toilet. Now, this I can assure you is no way to win hearts and, and minds, no way at all. So 20 years later, we were at this stage when you look back at a ledger and say it was an unmitigated disaster. Yes, we had some very heroic attempts to give some rights to women, etc. But you saw that within 24 hours of the Taliban taking away, it all went back to zero. And this, for me, as someone from that part of the world, I think is the biggest tragedy of all. Instead of helping a modern drive and thrust towards 
for Islamic societies. We have set the clock back, not only for the American presence in that part of the world, but for any one of us who cares for civil rights, humanism, for human rights, for minority rights, for all of us, you've pushed us back 30, 40 years, and I'm, I'm not sure how we are going to regroup and move ahead. And perhaps the biggest tragedy of all, uh, again, I don't think it's sunken into the American mind yet, but perhaps the biggest tragedy is that one of the consequences is this terrible, unnecessary, and exaggerated anti-Americanism that's emerged, this chest beating, this uh, argument for isolationism, hell with the world, we'll hide behind our own ramparts and we don't care for the world. I completely disagree with that. America has a role to play in the world. America needs to get back off its, onto its feet, off its bottom and get back into the game. And to remember that it is an extraordinary nation. It is a nation of great resilience, great character, great honor. And it must now show that face, show the beautiful, the wonderful face to the rest of the world, to be there for those people and say, we are here, we are here for you. We are going to be back to help you with colleges, with schools, with development projects, not with drones and missiles. And that is the face of America. I can assure you after decades of studies and talking to people that, that the, this face of America, this American will be welcome anywhere in the world. And this was the America that I grew up with. I was educated in Pakistan. One of the colleges I went to was called Foreman Christian College, run by American Presbyterians, the most popular teachers in Pakistan. Even today, in spite of everything that's happened in the region, that was the one institution that the Taliban never, ever attacked. And it's an institution that's produced presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, ambassadors. Why can't we go back to the Muslim world and say, we are sorry for everything that's happened, but we are here to help you. And here are the kinds of things we can do for you. And in that sense, recover our own soul, our own identity, and help those people who we have wittingly or unwittingly literally destroyed in the millions. We often don't think about it, but if you see any of these documentaries coming out of uh, these countries where uh, you have uh, projects, you have different European uh, societies creating limbs for the limbless, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. You suddenly see an entire society devastated, men, women without a hand, without a leg, simply because they were at the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time. And I want to end with this. Even the vocabulary of these two decades, it's shameful as a human being looking at history. I feel ashamed that the vocabulary that emerges, decapitated, collateral damage. We were treating human beings as if though they were worse than animals. I want to restore, help restore America and its own concepts and words such as compassion, forgiveness, love, love thy neighbor. I want to help America understand that those are the things we love and admire about America. So let me end, let me end on this note. Thank you so much, David, for giving me a chance to, to vent. Thank you. Not venting at all. Uh, I think just helpful words. So Ambassador Ahmed, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to our last speaker for the, for the moment, uh, who's Ngakia Kamara, a fantastic student at American University. But I do just wanna prime everyone that we're gonna move to a question and answer and conversation period. So feel free to start putting any questions or comments in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. You'll also have a chance to raise your virtual hand or your literal hand, uh, in which case I'd actually ask you to wave it vigorously at, just so I can be sure to see it uh, after we hear from um, Ngakia Kamara. Let me just provide a quick introduction. Ngakia Kamara is a leader of the American University chapter of dissenters which is a new youth-led national movement organization. It is, as it says, leading our generation to reclaim our resources from the war industry, reinvest in life-giving institutions and repair collaborative relationships with the earth and people around the world. At American University, Ngakia is studying political science, African-American and African diaspora studies and gender, race and politics. Ngakia, please take us away. 
Hello, everyone, and thank you, David, for inviting me and allowing me to talk a little bit about the centers with you all. I'm going to put some things into perspective before I um, start discussing what the centers is about and what we're doing at American University. Being at the heart of DC at this prestigious institution for the last three years has ironically taught me a lot about the nation state we're so proudly named after. As we sit and learn on stolen knock and talk, Anacostan and Piscataway territory, I recognize this country as a 500 year long colonial project, a project forged in white supremacy, grounded in exploitative racial capitalism and mobilized through relentless oppression. A colonial project whose function relies on a combative otherization that promises a persistent enemy, the antithesis of the white, the wealthy, the capitalist, to be fought, controlled, and won over in the name of imperialist objectives. This includes indigenous peoples who were slaughtered in the name of colonial expansion, the black folks whose enslavement promised persistent capitalist exploitation, and Arabs villainized in an effort to maintain control of oil and other resources abroad. It is, it is a colonial project generating a false white supremacist illusion, an enthusiastic oblivion, which obscures this reality of exploitation and promises comfort to those that contribute to, in, to the order of the system. These people become willing agents of the state, reiterating American patriotic rhetoric or serving as the armed militia, which both line the streets to disappear black and brown communities and storm the Capitol at the president's convenience who rely upon and defend this colonial project to maintain their state sanctioned supremacy. Those willing agents, and especially the hegemony they serve, will continue to line their po pockets from our suffering, benefiting as industries grow from our poverty and exploitation, profiting from fueling wars on our streets and abroad to maintain unlicensed access to endless resources, to extract free labor, and to gain monetarily from industries like the weapons manufacturers, which rely on this turmoil to expand. We strive to demolish this colonial project, this supremacy and this hierarchy. We strive to realize a vision that encourages not power over, but power with. A vision in which we collectively contribute to the creation of systems that work for all of us. This is why I've joined the centers a national grassroots organization working to turn the tide against war by educating our youth about the threat of the military industrial complex and how war and militarism impact their everyday lives. Emphasizing the destruction from war on a global scale, the center stresses the inevitable connectedness between militarism, police violence, racism, poverty, climate change, and other phenomena that persistently threatens global societies while perpetuating violence against marginalized communities at home, like black and brown, indigenous, and other impoverished communities. Overall, our goal is to reclaim resources and funding persistently given to war-making industries like weapons manufacturers and war profiteers, and to redirect those resources to our communities as well as life-giving institutions like our education system. The Divest from Death campaign ultimately embodies this latter mission of dissenters, asking youth to urge their school boards to divest in wealth, research, and overall support from any war industry they may have stakes in. With this campaign, we hope that major educational institutions stop funding and researching for the war industry, and that this can increase the stigma of war for our generation. At American University specifically, our, our first goal within this divestment campaign is to remove Wes Bush, former CEO of Northrop Grumman from our board of trustees. I'm sure you're all aware that Northrop Grumman is one of five major weapons manufacturing companies in the world. During his time there, he oversaw the mass creation of B-2 bombers, F-35s, and other lethal weapons and technology used to assault and destroy populations all over the world, including within Palestine. Wes Bush has made a career profiting from war, and he does not represent students at American University, nor does he reflect American University's stated values and initiatives. As members of the AU community, we urge you all to join our call for the board to remove war profiteer Wes Bush from his position and encourage him to resign. As AU proudly advertises being an institution with a reputation for creating meaningful change in the world, and where leaders of today train the leaders of tomorrow, 
Appointing someone like Bush to a leadership position is in deep contradiction with these stated values. It is the responsibility of those in leadership at AU to take immediate action on this issue. I'm going to place a few links in the chat for you all. This letter will let our administration know that we want no ties with war criminals, war mongers, and profiteers feeding on death and destruction for wealth. I encourage you all, students and professors, AU affiliated or not, to sign this letter. And if there are any students that are interested in organizing with us, please fill out our interest form. We hope that in the future, American University not only has a board which will most accurately demonstrates the interests of our student body, but that the conduct that each board member portrays has dignity and morality, which reflects American University. Thank you so much. I'll place everything in the chat for you all. Ngakia, thank you so much for those beautiful and powerful words and for the resources that you'll be placing in the chat. For those watching the video later, I'll make sure that that link is in the description on uh, the video on YouTube. I'm also gonna put another link, which has a set of resources, including a, a link to dissenters, the national organization, and some of the organizations represented by speakers today. I wanna to turn things over in just a moment to questions from the audience, comments from the audience of, of any kind. Again, you can place them in the chat where I'll, I'll, I'm happy to read them. Uh, or if you wanna raise your hand, uh, either the virtual hand or your physical hand, uh, please do. I do wanna give each of the speakers a, a brief, if we can keep it to one minute so we have enough time um, to, to get to questions and answers from the uh, and, and conversation from, with the audience. Um, but I wanna give uh, any of the speakers a, a moment to respond to anything else they've heard from, from the other speakers. David, um, I want to make a point if I have a, a minute. Do I have a minute? You do, please do. Uh, we are ending one chapter of American history, a chapter that began on 9-11 and ends with the fall of Kabul. So that's one chapter, a uh, very clearly defined, demarcated chapter. But before the grave, before the body of this chapter has really become cold in the grave, another chapter has already opened up, which to my mind is fraught with all kinds of dangers, tensions, and genuine, genuine possibility of catastrophe. And that is the new alliance just formed literally two or three days ago between the USA, UK, and Australia with the Chinese, which the aim was for the Chinese to contain the Chinese and the Chinese of course have seen it in that light and they're responding in kind. And it scares the hell out of me because you just come out of one danger where you had an asymmetry, the world superpower against these impoverished tribal societies, but now you have two genuine superpowers engaged in a kind of drift towards confrontation. I don't think any of the governments wants confrontation but that's not how confrontations and world wars start, as we know from both the First World War and the Second World War. So I would want uh, our students and scholars and activists to be aware that we have entered perhaps an even more fraught and dangerous period of history, and it will require all the sensitivities, the humanism, and the wisdom to try to prevent a greater catastrophe on the horizon. Thank you. Can I quick comment briefly? Um, Dr. Halal, let me just see if there's any of the other members of the panel. Um, yes, no, please, please do, go ahead. Okay, so um, I just wanna comment on a, a couple of things I think that um, Professor Akbar Ahmed said. Um, one, I've always found the idea of winning hearts and minds very problematic because I don't, I'm not sure what the hearts and minds are being won for other than to accept US imperialism and violence. And so I think that that's a very problematic construction. Um, 
you know, number two, I think in these narratives, it's often the case that, for example, um, veterans have more of a voice than the people who have been impacted. And this is not a slight on veterans, but I think it's very important to realize that that dynamic is happening. Because when you talk about when veterans sort of come into the, the discourse, right, it's often the case, or people even working in government who have formerly worked in government, it's often the case that their voice is sort of seen as the legitimizer to all of the victims who have already spoken about their pain and suffering. Um, and, I, you know, I know that there's a lot of women who do great work on this, um, like uh, Pam Campos Palma and Brittany DeBarros, um, for, for people that are interested in that, um, that discourse. So um, I think those are the two things I wanted to say. Actually, one more thing, and I'll be quick. The idea also of Muslim rage is a very problematic trope. <laughs> the idea that Muslims are just inherently angry and there's like absolutely no explanation. And that when the United States goes into war, somehow any rage that they respond with is just um, something that other communities would not respond with had their countries been attacked, demolished and intervened in. So I think we need to abandon this narrative of Muslim rage. Uh, I, I just want to respond in case Dr. Hilal is assuming that there's any association between the point she's made and my presentation, because I use the concept of winning hearts and minds, not as my concept, but a concept that's promoted by the US government over the last two decades. And I pointed out that when you urinate on dead bodies in, in Afghanistan and flush the Quran in the toilet, that is not winning anyone's hearts and minds. As far as anger is concerned, I did not refer to Muslim anger at all. I think, again, she misunderstood. I was talking about the American response. And if you go back, Dr. Ilal, and listen to President Bush's speeches right from the start, from his earliest responses, he kept talking about anger. He kept using this word anger and revenge. Now, if you use those, those words, you're obviously reflecting a mood. And that's the mood as a scholar, which I tried to capture and point out that Benjamin Franklin had warned us that what begins in anger ends in shame. So again, it's quite contrary to your understanding of what I said. Let me invite um, Claire Bayer to jump into the conversation. I'm just gonna move quickly, get as many people in as possible. Um, yeah, on a different note, and I'm still digesting what everyone has said. Um, so much good, good, uh, important food for thought here. Dr. Hilal, I really appreciated you calling out the assumption um, that's so ingrained here about why should state violence be seen as inherently moral and non-state actors violence be immoral. And I think that comes back to the question that Dr. Wilkerson raised, which is why the hell do we do these wars? What is the agenda and interest behind the idea that somehow it's rational to launch wars to make money and that that excuses the amount of violence and devastation done, why that should somehow be, um, be estimated as a moral act rather than it's set in opposition to the idea of terrorism. And I also appreciate the lifting up around because we think we're God and pointing out the role of dominionism and Christian hegemony in these wars. And I mean, these wars back to the establishment of this country, the entwining of Christian supremacy with white nationalism is part of what laid the foundations of what we are dealing with with the current wars. And we can't look at it without looking at those roots. And I don't know if you will get a chance to answer this, Colonel Wilkerson, but I would love to, to hear your thoughts if you're able to share, because there are so few people who were in positions like yours in, in relationship to the design and launch of these wars, who are now speaking out in the ways that you are. Would love to just hear any of your thoughts about what are the things that you could see us doing concretely to repair the harm of these wars? Great question, and I don't want to, uh, well, uh, Colonel Wilkerson, if you'd like to respond, um, please do, you could be next. Uh, I do want to just uh, read one of the comments from the chat from uh, Nor Butt. I strongly endorse the suggestions put forward by Professor Akbar Ahmed about restoring the respect and prestige of the great nation, the US, by showing the will to help people of other countries rather than following the policy of controlling and dominating them with pressure and force the policy in the past decades, which has tarnished the US image and has brought shame as in Afghanistan. Very good analysis of American policy of the past. Good luck. 
Colonel Wilkerson or, or if anyone else wanted to jump in. Well, um, I just wanted to say may I have just, just, just one thing. I, I, uh, I couldn't help but think about the very first days post 9-11 when Colin Powell and his lawyer, Will, William Howard Taft IV, a very famous name in American politics and himself a former deputy secretary of defense, turned lawyer for Colin Powell during his secretariat, we were having this discussion about using the war instrument. And we not only talked about what I mentioned before, that is you give unparalleled power to the executive when you use the war instrument. And that's extremely dangerous, especially when you issue an authorization for the use of military force that's so blanket, it goes out all across everything in the world. And Barbara Lee, I think, if I remember right, Barbara Lee was the only Congress member who saw that and voted against it. God bless her. She was the only one of 435 members of our august legislature who saw the potential of that authorization to do what it did. But I was thinking also of Bush's own admission that he brought some evangelical leaders into the Oval Office because he wanted them to help him keep his rage down. Being a born again himself, he recognized that maybe Christ the real Christ wouldn't react this way. And so he was asking them, Franklin, no, it's Billy Graham, I think, and a, a group of others. He was asking them to, to help him restrain his rage, which was the environment in which he was making his decisions, fear and rage, which any theorist of war will tell you is the worst possible environment in which to make a decision for war. <laughs> this was an incredible moment, really, because we had already signaled to the president, we had already said, this is a moment of global solidarity unparalleled. Look at what's happening across the globe. People are in sympathy with the United States of America. NATO's invoked Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all for the first time in the alliance's history. A million Iranians marched by candlelight to express their sympathy. This is a moment of global solidarity. You use the war instrument, we're gonna destroy it. That's what we did. Let me see if Jenny or Kyle or Ngakia wanted to respond quickly to anything they've heard. Yeah, I think that I've heard basically two ideas put forth about how we can shift the American empire writ large from a war making machine into something else. And I'm not sure that they're necessarily in conflict with each other, but I think that they're often conflated in a way that's problematic. It makes it hard to act. Um, one is that the American people, this is a democracy, the American people need to understand and sort of change our hearts um, and our culture from a war making one to something else. And the second is this was about money. And this was about money for contractors. And this was a decision that was made in sort of the halls of power, regardless of what the American people would have wanted. Um, and I think that the decision that we make about which one of those is most powerful means a lot about how we act to change what's happening. And for the record, I think it's the second. Thank you, Jenny, for that really helpful framework. Kyle or Ngakia? I mean, I guess I'll say, um, <clears throat> you know, I have, I've been just kind of thinking about what was said earlier um, by uh, Dr. Halal and how, you know, it, you know, you, br you brought up the point that, um, the conversations around these wars, particularly in the U.S., is constantly centered on veterans. And, you know, that's something that it, it has been so frustratingly true for us at this organization, uh, at Common Defense. Um, you know, uh, just from my own personal experiences, um, there's, you know, uh, we've done press on on this constantly. I mean, you know, we, we, we do interviews, we do all sorts of, and, you know, one of our rules is that we have to always remember to center what the, the trauma and the carnage that takes place uh, overseas um, 
in Afghanistan as, as like the real actual harm and injustice of these wars. Um, and what has been frustrating for us in this space is that, you know, um, what you're saying is so true because we bring this up and it almost never makes the cut, <laughs> you know, um, and, and really, and, and I think it serves to emphasize how as much as, you know, and I, and I think I had to, I got into this a little bit towards the end of my, my first section, things have not changed as much as we would like to think that they have changed. Um, the emphasis in viewing U.S. involvement overseas purely through a military lens, um, viewing the, the real harm being done to all these service members who died and are traumatized, which certainly is traumatic and difficult. And, you know, I carried my own trauma as well as members of our team. But, you know, the, the real carnage of these wars for years has been going on in communities overseas. And, um, you know, people, you know, an example in 2019, I think, the deadliest conflict in the world in 2019 was Afghanistan, and it was deadlier than Syria and Yemen put together. And, and that's a lot. And let's also take into account that the United States is involved in Syria and Yemen as well, right? So this is the all expansive, you know, um, you know just, just, just again, we talk about the blob in terms of the foreign policy kind of establishment in Washington, DC, the momentum it has and, and kind of the unquestioned, like just, just I don't know, uh, philosophy that goes forward from it. Uh, but, you know, there's literally also the blob of the literal blob of military presence in the U.S. involvement around the world. And again, we constantly center it on on veterans like us, which is difficult, you know, uh, because we want to we we try to have that conversation. And I think oftentimes, um, you know, even when we do uh, the U.S., the press, um, you know, other folks, they 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 just don't allow it to happen because, again, we have the jingoism is baked so deeply into our international or excuse me, our national DNA. That, that, you know, it, it's really actually hard for us to conceptualize the harm on, on the quote unquote other, right? So, so anyway, um, I, don't know, I just wanted to emphasize that it's such a strong point and, and it really gets lost, I think, so much in the U.S. discourse around these wars. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, I wanted to read another comment in the chat box and then open things up uh, to additional questions, comments in whether the chat box or if folks want to use their actual voice. Uh, thank you, Ngekia Kamara. You summed up the US colonialism abroad and domestically perfectly. Also appreciate your voice, Dr. Halal. Both of your voices are needed. Disappointing that there are not more Afghan voices in this conversation besides Nasreen in the second panel. Point very much taken. David, you'll have to excuse me. I have to go to class now to teach a class. So I want to say how much I'm enjoying this, but regrettably I have to run. Colonel Wilkerson, let me salute you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Akbar. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I was only here from about two o'clock, so I got to hear a little bit of what Dr. Hilal had to say. Um, and I took note of what you said about um, who is the legitimizer or um, veterans being the legitimizer of the pain and the suffering, despite, um, you know, the voices. I'm gonna put a light towards you because you're, you look very dark. Um, Sorry, Ngekia, go ahead. That's okay, that's okay. Um, when the voices of those who are actually being oppressed um, have already been um, spoken and they're talking about their experiences and why not the centering, um, as you were saying, Kyle. Um, I have my ideas about why this is, but I really wanted to gauge a little bit more of why you think um, we center um, the voices of veterans um, over the voices of those who are actively um, experiencing this um, for their lives, basically. So that was a question for me, just to be clear. Um, uh, just anyone, really. Oh, okay. um, I mean, I could start, I guess. I mean, I, I certainly have opinions. I think, you know, um, I think, um, well, we could start with some of the obvious. Our military has a lot of white males. And quite frankly, I think it's a lot easier in the US discourse to, to empathize with 
with white men rather than, you know, the, the sort of cultural distance of people from a different country or, and the literal distance of people on the other side of the world. Um, you know, I think, um, <laughs> you know, uh, part of it is also, um, you know, as, as I kind of said towards the end, as I was trying to wrap up, jingoism and like, and, and this, you know, the, the obsession, the, the mil like I used it before, the militarization of our culture, it's so baked into our DNA that, you know, um, we, we view these wars, um, and again, to talk a bit about um, Dr. Hillel's point, um, we view our wars and our execution of violence as inherently correct because it comes from us and it, it, is, it is a state sort of violence, right? Um, so uh, the people who then execute that, you know, we want to assume are, are good people or people who get caught up in, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot of, um, I, I think it's, it comes down to the, the sort of emotional and cultural distance that, that people uh, have um, and really just the dehumanization that we've allowed of people in other countries, black and brown countries that are overwhelmingly um, on the other end of our bombs and our bullets. And, and you know, so I think, um, I think that plays pretty heavily into it. Um, in the US, we, we empathize with certain peoples more, more than others, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it, it teases out that way, you know? And I would say, I mean, as a corollary, you know, obviously Muslim uh, lives have been totally dehumanized and in any conflict, right? The oppressed lives are totally dehumanized. And in this example, right, when talking about the war on terror, Americans don't care about Muslim lives, whether it's domestically or abroad. And when it comes to the US too, you have to remember that veterans have a lot of political power. Muslims do not, right? And obviously Muslims encompasses a broad range of people, but Muslims do not. And veterans are also constructed in a positive way. Muslims are not. So there's also these battling constructions. And this happens across other conflicts, right? Whoever has an identity that is sort of of the oppressor or whatever it is, right? Um, their voices are the ones that legitimize and, and really bring life into what is actually happening. And I have to say one more thing is that I just, sometimes it sounds like what people are more interested in is the experience of the individual veteran, as opposed to what has actually happened in the war zone, in the conflict that their experience took place in. And I think this happens with people in government too, their voices, former government officials, right? Their, their voices legitimize, again, what we already know has been happening. Thank you, Dr. Halal. We only have about five minutes until we're going to transition to our second panel. We are going to try to uh, keep to time, but I so I want to invite people in the audience to offer questions, comments as people are, are thinking, and I'm going to look for both physical hands and virtual hands. Um, I'm putting some additional links in the chat, which, which you can find them all in the first link that I provided, and they will also be in the description uh, of this video if you're watching on YouTube. Yes, Lee. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Hi. Yeah, I um, I wanted to ask a question. I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm reposing a question that Claire asked of Lawrence Wilkerson of what repair could look like um, and feel, you know, like I want to repost the question because I don't feel like we heard a full answer to that and also expand it to the rest of the panel. Um, of Like we've talked a lot about the harm and want to think about what repair of that harm could look like. Fantastic question. Let me see if there, if we could get one or two more and then give our panelists a chance to respond. I'm so glad you brought us back to the question of repair. Not seeing any others, I think there couldn't be a more important question perhaps than, than that. So let me see among the panelists who would like to take that on first. Yeah, I David, I'll give you some concrete moves I think we could make. That would be great. Um, you know well what I'm going to say. Uh, the first thing we should do is cut the military budget in half. In half. 
hundred billion dollars out of the budget every year for the next 10 years would be a minimum that I would do. And there's all kinds of things you could do with that money that would be much more positive and much better, including reparations to some of the people we've murdered all over the world. Um, the second thing I do is take the some 750 to 800 outposts that the empire has all over the world and cut them back to about a dozen or maybe a dozen and a half. Maybe I'd go for zero ultimately. And that's not isolationism. What that is, is taking in those outposts of the military instrument of the empire that in and of themselves cause these wars because they invite comment from that outpost. And you would not be, you, you would be surprised at how powerful this is, how powerful an incentive this is that says, oh, there's a terrorist behind the tree over there. Oh, there's a communist over there or whatever. And then it begins. It's beginning all over the Sahel right now. That's how it spread from Afghanistan to the Red Sea all throughout the Levant, because we have these outposts and these outposts are an invitation to war in the region in which they're situated. And then the third thing I do is get rid of the contractors, get rid of the contractors. No more contractors for, you, for DOD. What we have done in this country is taken the ultimate public function, war and making war, and contracted it out to private interests. That's what we've done. So eliminate all the contractors. Now, all of those things are politically impossible to do at least in reasonable time, but they're not politically impossible to do over time. And if we had a good enough movement and a powerful enough political movement, and we could get some support in the Congress, and if we don't get it, elect some new people who will give it to us, we could start this. Thank you, Colonel Wilkerson. Can I see we're running up on on our, our on our the, the time limit for this first panel? But if if other members of the panel want to offer some very quick thoughts about the question of repair or other final thoughts. Well, I might just throw at least one other uh, thought in terms of repair. I would echo those um, that were just outlined, but I, I think you know the responsibility and uh, the cost of war project has has shown this. Um, the U.S. wars uh, have, in addition to the death, in addition to injury, uh, displaced upwards of 38 million people in just the eight most violent wars that. The U.S. military has been engaged in since 2001. The U.S. has, it seems to me, a tremendous responsibility to welcome and resettle literally millions of those refugees and to provide additional humanitarian assistance uh, through the U.N. Uh, to others who are displaced internally in their own countries. Uh, I'm pleased uh, that it does seem there are uh, a majority of people in the United States support resettling Afghan refugees in particular and have shown some degree of, of empathy and, and, and um, desire, again, to, to help and support those refugees. But I think, of course, the, the U.S. responsibility goes far beyond Afghan refugees alone, given the, the millions displaced in Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and beyond. Uh, and just important to point out that uh, in the years after the U.S. war in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, more than a million Vietnamese refugees ended up uh, being resettled in the United States, in addition to thousands more Lao and Cambodians. Um, so it's, it is something that, that, that we can do quite easily. Um, I, I, what I'd like to do is to thank our, our first panel. Um, I'd like everyone to, to uh, give the first group of amazing panelists uh, a, a huge round of applause. And, and I, personally, I just want to thank you for, again, taking your time and sharing your thoughts and, and all that you put into this incredibly stimulating and helpful conversation. I hope that our, our first group of panelists can, can stay with us. I invite you to stay with us. Um, and I invite everyone to stay with us. I'm gonna quickly transition into our, our second panel.
Uh, and uh, but but again, uh, we, we this will be a, a conversation after we hear from this next group of panelists and um, hopefully some of our, our first panelists will, will be able to stay and, and participate in that that subsequent conversation. going to share my screen again briefly to, to provide something of an introduction for those of us, for those who, who joined uh, recently. Um, we now we're moving to our second panel. Uh, we'll have Phyllis Bennis and Gakia Kamara is going to be able to uh, stay with us for part of the second panel uh, before she also has to move, move to class. Um, Raj Girard, uh, Peter Kuznick, Laura Nader, and Nasreen Sajadi. Uh, who also is coming uh, a bit later uh, from class. She's a teacher. Um, again, uh, thank you to everyone for juggling schedules and uh, making, uh, making it possible uh, for you to be here. 